Hey guys, it's Dr. Justin Marcajani here. Evan Brand, happy Monday. How you doing? Happy Monday to you, man. I'm doing great. Summer's going along fast. I mean, it's already like mid-August now. And before you know it, it's going to be September, October, November. Then I'll be complaining that it's cold. So I know. Can you believe it, man? Time flies when you're having fun. Any uh, fun stuff happen this weekend for you? Not, not, I mean, every weekend's fun, but nothing out of the ordinary. You know, we, we did some hiking and saw yeah. a bunch of butterflies and, oh, we did get chiggers on us. That was not fun. Oh, chiggers are interesting. We, yeah. We two weeks, not two weeks, two hours picking chiggers off of us. They were so small. I had a little magnifying glass. You literally could barely even see it. At first I thought it was wow. ticks, too small. And so now we're all covered in chigger bites. But besides that, we're doing good. Excellent. Very good, man. Yeah, doing a lot of water skiing this weekend, uh, enjoying Austin. It wasn't quite as hot as it normally is in the summer this weekend, so it was pretty fun. That's great. Yeah, you're going to you're gonna miss out on the, uh, the water. I guess we'll have to revisit the water. Totally. Absolutely. Well, let's dig in, man. Let's talk about our top 10 anti-inflammatory foods. So we make a lot of recommendations to patients on, you know, certain foods. And, you know, we tend to follow like a paleo template, right? And the paleo template is nothing more than utilizing anti-inflammatory nutrient dense and low toxin foods. And we typically animal protein, the quality components also factored in, right? Organic, pasture fed, you know, antibiotic free, hormone free. Animal products can have a lot of really great nutrient density, right? A lot of people that are plant-based, they kind of miss out on that. You know, uh, I get a lot of conversations with people on nutrient density. So for instance, 500 calories of grass-fed meat packs a lot of nutrition, right? You can get 500 calories of grass-fed meat in about eight ounces of meat, which is pretty reasonable, right? A lot of people, they'll go out and they'll get like a seven, you know, a six to eight ounce kind of filet mignon or a bigger ribeye, a lot of good nutrients there. To get 500 calories of kale, you got to consume 16 cups of kale. That's a lot of kale. Most people would never consume that much. So the nutrient density is easier in some of these animal products and it's easier to get. It's easier to access. Most people couldn't do 16 cups of kale in two days, let alone one day, but almost anyone could do eight ounces of grass fed meat at one meal. And I'll typically, if I go to a nice steak restaurant, I'll even do, I'll even do 16 in one meal. If it's a good ribeye. Yeah. Let's talk about why. I mean, why is it so important? You got to have these nutrients to, for one, right. you got to stabilize your blood sugar. And so if you're not getting good fats, good mm -hmm. proteins in, you're not stabilizing blood sugar. And then two, all the different right. micronutrients and amino acids that you get from your meats, those go in to fuel hormones and neurotransmitters. So right. this is why like vegetarians and vegans, they come to us so often, but they a lot of times have a mental health issue, like an anxiety problem. And it's because they have no protein in, or if they do have protein, as you mentioned, it's beans. And then they have a bunch of digestive problems because they're eating like cups of beans a day. Yeah. So when we look at animals, right, animals have a great ability to concentrate plant matter. So part of the reason why a lot of animal products can be superfood is because they concentrate plant matter. Number two, if you do organ meats, organ meats, if you look at like, just Google like vitamin A, you know, animal versus plant. I mean, you're going to see a lot of the plant stuff. It's, it's beta carotene and uh, precursor compounds, right? These mixed carotenoids, these beta carotene things, they have to get converted, right? It's not active vitamin A, but if you get animal-based vitamin A, whether it's from cod liver oil or actually liver, liver glandular or from good quality grass-fed meat, it's already activated. So a lot of these nutrients are already activated in animal-based forms. And number two, they're, they're concentrated, right? Part of the reason they're concentrated is because the animals concentrate plant matter as they grow. If they're, you know, if they're like a natural kind of sustainably farm type of thing, they're going to be grass fed and they're going to have access to it. We're not talking about the CAFO feedlot thing. A lot of these, you know, documentaries you'll see like cowspiracy, they kind of just like lump in all animal products are like this and they, they pretend like there isn't another option over here that uses organic and kind of like naturally farmed uh, protocols yeah. to make it work, right? Yep. Well said. Let's talk about gut real quick and then we'll get into the food. So if your yeah. gut's inflamed, you're going to have a leaky gut situation. Mm -hmm. You and I measure this on stool testing. We look at levels of calprotectin. We look at secretory IgA. And Correct. if your gut's inflamed, you're more susceptible to pick up infections. So bacteria and parasites and worms and everything else that we see, if your gut's leaky because your gut's inflamed because you're eating inflammatory foods, that's a big like domino effect. And you could take all the herbs in the world to kill your infections, but you have to have 
an anti-inflammatory diet at the base of it. Otherwise, it won't work. I'll just give an example. I did a case review this morning with some clients, and they're vegetarians. And I've been really trying to get them to eat animal protein, but they won't listen to me. The biggest foundation of their diet is grains. And we looked at their IgA levels, and their IgA levels are still terrible. Now, we did clear some infections, but they have a bunch of parasites. And I don't think they're be going to be able to heal their gut if they stay 100% vegetarian. All they eat is like salad three times a day, and then they poop out undigested leafy greens. It's like your body's trying to tell you something, but they won't listen. So Exactly, and that's a really important component. We talk about some of these foods. There's lots of different ways and mediums which these foods can be consumed soup or smoothie or, or juiced or sauteed or cooked. I think it's really important that you, one, you should be able to digest and break down these foods. Like some people may say, I have a really terrible experience eating meat. Well, why? Right. Your digestive system probably stinks. And that's why you have a hard time breaking it down. Your hydrochloric acid and enzyme levels probably aren't good. So you can't break the amino acids down in the meat. So typically when patients are like that, I say, hey, eat the highest amount of meat that you can handle without any negative consequences. That may be an ounce, right? And then I'll say, well, let's try making it so it's broken down even better. Maybe use a soup type of form where everything's broken down, cooked, peeled, mashed, sauteed. That way there's the, the least amount of stress on your gut to extract these nutrients. So when we go into our top 10 list, it's not going to be in order of like, you know, ones being the best, tens the worst. We'll just kind of give you our top 10 categories. And from there that you guys can uh, figure out what works for you. But in general, um, the cooking method may be really important. Like Evan said, if you can't process the, the, the leafy greens and such, and you see a whole bunch of stuff in your stool, that may be a problem. Yeah, you, you got to do something. Big so time. Let's dive in. All right, cool. So off the bat, I would just say, we'll just kind of go into our animal products. I would say grass-fed meat um, and grass-fed, you know, not grass-fed, but I would say like wild-caught salmon, um, cod, haddock, fish that are very high in omega-3s that are more wild-caught are going to have excellent amount of omega-3s and along with grass-fed meat, which is going to have a very high amount, amount of omega-3s because the grass increases the omega-3 content and decreases the omega-6. Omega-6 is a more inflammatory kind of arachidonic acid 2 pathway or prostaglandin 2 pathway, more inflammatory. So if you get more of the grass-fed, you're going to increase the omega-3s and that anti-inflammatory fat. Yep. And the good thing is you can actually measure this. If someone wants to get their blood checked, you can do like an omega-3 or omega-6 blood test and you can look at your ratios what we saw prehistorically was closer to a one to one ratio omega-3 to 6 now it's something crazy like 20 times higher omega-6 in the diet versus omega-3 because there's peanut oil and other omega-6 rich oils in all the foods that you eat at restaurants totally totally so i'm gonna put the i'm gonna put the um the high quality salmon and the omega-3 fish on there i'm gonna put the grass-fed meat on there I would even go into high quality saturated fats like coconut oil. Coconut oil is going to be an excellent one, especially if there's any inflammation. Most people can tolerate coconut oil. I'd even say some could probably even do butter. Butter can be really anti-inflammatory, but some people may have a reaction to the small amount of lactose or casein in there. So ghee may be better, but the more inflamed you are, a good quality saturated fat, coconut tends to be very helpful and it's very heat stable too. So the cooking of that won't oxidize it and make it a, a free radical based fat like yeah. trans fat i would add avocados to the list while we're talking about fats i do an yep. avocado not every day i did yep. get obsessed with avocados for a bit and started getting migraine headaches from them maybe some type of histamine reaction or mm -hmm. or polyol reaction i'm not sure what it was but uh, i believe is an avocado a fodmap it is it's a moderate fodmap it's also a mono unsaturated fat so it's, it's a good one. It's that good meme on the face on Facebook. I, I see a lot. It's just great. It's like a, a, an avocado looking in the mirror, like having a conversation with himself. And he's like, you're fat. And then he goes, but you're a good fat. Exactly. <laughs> so, I love that. Isn't it a great little meme? So I like it. It's a good quality fat, a lot of good nutrient density in there. And I'd even go to good egg yolks next, eggs and or egg yolks. Uh, I would say some people that can't tolerate eggs may still be able to tolerate the yolk, which has a lot of good fat soluble vitamins. So I would go to the eggs and or egg yolks next. And again, just to be clear to everyone, if we, if we don't highlight the quality, the quality is always assumed to be the highest. So pasture fed, you know, organic, you know, cage free, of course, will be assumed uh, with all the quality of foods we talk about here. There's a huge difference. Let me say a note about that. There's a big difference even between certified organic eggs and certified organic pastured pasture and fed. local eggs. Yes. 
So like the whole foods, organic eggs, the yolk is still pretty yellow, but we get these local eggs. There's a pasture like 20 minutes from here. The eggs are, the yolk is so orange. You can't even believe it. You've never even seen a yolk like that. So if you guys haven't sought out a local farm, go on the website, eat wild, just Google eat wild or local harvest and type in your zip code and you can find all sorts of farms and you could probably find farmers markets where you're going to get legit, legit quality. Totally. And, and Joel Salatin, who runs Polyface Farm, he's taken some of his pasture fed organic eggs. He sent them to the lab and he's actually compared um, conventional eggs that he bought at the local grocery store near him. And, and again, this is, I haven't seen the lab analysis, but I, I trust Joel. He said that the full weight levels in his eggs were 20 times higher than the conventional eggs. That's amazing. So, I mean, it's like, let's say you do spend twice the amount of money on something. Let's say you don't even get 20 times more. Let's say you get three or four times more nutrition in certain parts. Is that worth it? I think so. Absolutely. Well, uh, so I posted on my Facebook page last week. I just put up a podcast with Stephanie Sinniff all about glyphosate. Yes, it was a really yes. good episode. And I told people that if you're not eating 100% organic, that you're slowly killing yourself. And the lady said that that I was an elitist and I was an a-hole and all these other mean names and it's because i told her that if you can afford a new iphone you can afford to pay the extra one dollar to get organic versus conventional i don't think that's elitist that's just saying you could probably spend the extra buck because if you don't spend the extra dollar now you're going to spend more money later down the road when you have a health problem caused from that food that was lower quality yeah i think it hits a lot of people's hot buttons because it's the argument really is about priorities right? It's where things are more important, money tends to go, right? The problem is there are a lot of people that kind of have an entitlement where they expect optimal health, but they want to put zero time or money towards it. And yeah. like, if you read Michael Pollan's book, I think it was the omnivorous dilemma. He talked about the amount of money that we used to put towards our food in the 1950s. It was about 18% of our daily income or our yearly income. And then today it's been down to 9%. So what does that mean? We're allocating 50% less of our resources to healthy quality food. And I mean, that's part of the reason why, you know, we're sicker as a country is that we want cheaper, more convenient food, which tends to be more processed and more inflammatory and less nutrition than it. So there's a sense of entitlement out there. And we're just trying to fix the entitlement by one, inspiring people and motivating them. And number two, giving them the education of like, all right, where can I get these things? Which foods are the best from a nutrient density, anti-inflammatory standpoint? And then piggybacking on that, the Monsanto had a big lawsuit. Um, they came back Friday night, it took a $290 million lawsuit with this, um, with this gentleman up in the Bay Area who was spraying pesticides. He worked on the school and he would spray pesticides and he ended up getting this lymphoma that was directly correlated, uh, connected to the Monsanto uh, Roundup glyphosate he was spraying. And it's interesting, I wanna just kind of go off this riff one sec, is the attorney for Monsanto was saying, hey, we have 80 studies saying it's totally safe, but they still ruled in his favor because the evidence was so compelling. So my question is, how the heck do you have such strong evidence where a judge is going to rule in your favor, which is so hard against a Monsanto team that has like the best lawyers, probably teams of attorneys to rule against them when you have 80 studies saying it doesn't? That kind of makes me second guess how these studies could even be created where you can manipulate the sample size. You may not have a great group to compare it to. Maybe you're not giving an accurate amount of the dose of Roundup because you're not comparing all the different foods. How the, fa the fact is, how can you get 80 studies saying it when now you have evidence that people are actually um, coming down with it? That's, that's the scary part. And that makes me, let's just say second guess, a lot of conventional scientific research out there from all kinds of different mediums from various procedures and medications and drugs. Yeah, well said. And so just to clarify for people, if something is not marked organic at your grocery, you can assume that it is sprayed with glyphosate. We have millions, hundreds of millions of pounds sprayed in the U.S. each year. And it, it really should not be called conventional food. It should really be called chemical and then, so there's the chemical section and then there's the organic. It shouldn't be conventional because that's not conventional. Conventional was organic just a short time ago. Now organic has to be labeled organic, but yes. your grandparents ate conventional in the 1940s before glyphosate was invented. And that was organic back then because glyphosate right. didn't exist. And here's the, here's part of like the reason why a lot of this stuff skewed, right? If like you're Monsanto and you've invested billions of dollars into a product and you're researching the product. 
what are the odds are that you're going to come up with negative information? Let's just say shutting down this product, like, like showing that it's negative and bad and harmful. Now, again, a perfect world would happen is it would, you may, you may kind of like, you know, manipulate the study a little bit, a lawsuit like this happens. And then it sends a signal to every company. No, we got to be really careful because we don't want to be shut down with a massive lawsuit like this that would cripple a company. Number two is if I'm like, you know, Joe Schmo scientist at a university and I want to do a study at this, looking at the safety of glyphosate or Roundup, how do I get the ability to do a study on that? I have to license that product, that chemical from Monsanto. Do you think Monsanto is going to license that product to me to use in the study? Probably not. This is what becomes, this is becomes really hard to, to know the safety of some of these things where it's a little bit more, let's say, easier to do a study on vitamin C or an herb because there's no major patent or massive company behind it. So it's easier to study nutrients and herbs because that they're just out there in nature. There's no patent on it. No one has exclusive rights to it. So I think it's easier to believe some of the plant or nutrient or vitamin based research out there. But when you have a licensed product that people have invested billions into, it's harder to get unbiased research on those compounds. Yep. Agreed. So okay. eat organic is the goal. Check out the podcast with Stephanie because it'll make you just really understand why are we having so much trouble digesting gluten and dairy? And it's because of the glyphosate is replacing a glycine amino acid in the profile. So the protein literally becomes undigestible. It's mind blowing. It makes perfect sense. And this is why so many dog foods are going grain free. And a lot of these cat foods are going grain free. It's because the pets can't digest the food either because the food has glyphosate in it. And this is why these cats and dogs are having allergy problems and cancers, a lot of pet cancers. Totally makes sense. And we had a little kind of, we went off the, the beaten path here for a sec, but I think it's important to highlight this because if foods have these various residues, even if it's on our top 10 list here, it may not be a good food for that. Yeah. And a lot of our listeners that are already smart cookies, but if you see natural or something that does not mean anything, if you see organic, that is organic. That is a certification. It's completely different than natural. A little different. So, yeah. Yeah. Yep, organic. You, can, you can make that claim is a little more behind that claim. Let me say a couple things about coconut. You mentioned coconut oil. I would tell people too, if you, if you like it, or if you're looking for a swap and you're not doing well with like almond milk, or if you're still drinking conventional milk, coconut milk, you could do a full fat coconut milk. You could use that as creamer in your coffee. If you have to have it, you could do uh, just coconut butter is awesome. Like coconut cream is great. So there's, or just eat a straight coconut and eat the meat of the coconut. There's a tons of benefits. Totally. Now let's go into some various herbs that we can add with our foods. A uh, big fan of curcumin or turmeric, as well as ginger. And if any of my patients are listening, they know how much I like the ginger tea and how important it is for helping with biofilms and also helping with inflammation reduction. So ginger is excellent. And then also turmeric or curcumin, which is kind of the concentrated kind of active compound in turmeric is great for inflammation. And I have a, a liposomal curcumin, uh, a liposomal curcumin because a lot of turmeric isn't quite well absorbed in the powder form. So the liposome helps with the absorption. That product's called curcumin supreme. But in general, these, this can be excellent ways to reduce inflammation by adding the spice to your food, uh, supplementing with it, and or doing a ginger tea or a ginger kombucha can really help reduce inflammation in your body. Yeah, that's great. I would say cinnamon would be one to add to the list too of things you should have. Blood because, sugar too. Yeah, I love using cinnamon to help with stabilizing blood sugar. There's actually some mm -hmm. blood sugar supplements that have cinnamon as an ingredient. So that tells you how powerful it can be, not only as a spice or a flavoring, but just for if you're having issues with hypo or hyperglycemia, you could definitely look into it. Absolutely. And let's go into some various nuts and seeds. I mean, there's some really good seeds. Chia seeds are great. They have really good omega-3 content. Omega-3 is that anti-inflammatory um, fatty acid. Um, so we have the chia seeds in there. We also have walnuts, which are excellent for omega-3 fatty acid content. Um, are there any other seed? We have flax as well, which has some good omega-3 content. We've got to be careful with a lot of the plant-based fats, the plant-based fats uh, that are omega-3 based tend to be more alpha linolenic, linolenic, which has to get converted to a 20 carbon called EPA or eicosapentaenoic, 
which then gets converted to decosahexanoic, which is the 22 carbon. So it goes 18 carbon to 20 to 22. And this process of adding two carbons and two carbons basically re requires certain enzymes to be there and can decrease the conversion. So if that's why the, the animal fats tend to be a little bit more superior on the EPA and DHA side because of the conversion process. Because you're avoiding the conversion process, you're saying. You're just yeah, you're bypassing the conversion process when you're doing animal products. When you're doing plant, there is a conversion process. Now, the less inflamed you are and the more insulin sensitive you are, the more you can convert that. So there's an enzyme called Delta-5 desaturase. It's either Delta-5 or Delta-4, but that enzyme is involved in that alpha linolenic to eicosapentaenoic conversion and the more inflamed you are and the more insulin resistant you are that enzyme down regulates and decreases the conversion so you get less of those good quality anti-inflammatory omega-3s makes sense i'd like to add pumpkin seeds to the list i've been very high in zinc feeling so good with pumpkin seeds i found a brand that's organic just a little touch of salt on them and i do great with those and most people can tolerate those quite well Excellent. Very good. Now, if we go to some of the fruits, I mean, I would go to the more nutrient dense, lower sugar fruits because high sugar in, in higher forms can be inflammatory just because it increases insulin and then it causes these advanced glycation end products. So we got to be careful with the sugar component. So I would say things like um, blueberries, uh, raspberries, um, blackberries, strawberries, There's a lot of research with blueberries and the various bioflavonoids helping our neurological tissue and neurological health, decreasing Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, so a lot of these nutrients have a lot of phytonutrients, a lot of antioxidants. Some haven't been studied enough to even know the health benefits of. So I think it's always good to keep some of these components in there to maximize antioxidant levels and overall phytonutrients. I would throw in the citrus a bit too. Some lemons, some limes could be yes. great. I do that in the morning. A lot of people say that they just don't have an appetite to drink water or just they don't like the taste of it or something. So they just don't drink much, especially a lot of teenagers that I work with. So I just tell them, make a little homemade lemonade, do a dash of stevia or monk fruit, lime, lemon, and drink it. And that can be great. There's a ton of benefits to that. And even some of the heavy metal detox protocols that I've learned, the companies mm -hmm. recommend that the client drinks lemon to help during the process. So that's pretty cool. Totally. Absolutely. Is there anything else? So then we also have like our green vegetables. I mean, again, a lot of these green veggies are going to be very high in sulforaphane, uh, diendol methane, um, a lot of various anti-cancer, um, antioxidant compounds that are going to be very helpful. This could be or any green leafy vegetable. It could be bok choy. Um, it could be broccoli, just really good leafy greens, collard greens, very anti-inflammatory, very anti-cancer, very uh, estrogen metabolite type of um, estrogen metabolite detoxifying compounds, I would say. Yeah. Well, I mean, we even use broccoli extract in some of our protocols. So there's actually really, really good solid evidence on that helping with estrogen metabolism. So if you've had any type of uh, phthalate or plastic BPA type exposure, which everyone has, then broccoli extracts or just eating broccoli or broccoli sprouts are awesome. I have a friend who actually makes a lot of different sprouts. He grows them and sells them at the farmer's market and people love that stuff and they feel so That's good. Great. With it. That's great. I'd also say uh, bone broth and or organ meats kind of put them in the same category because they're more like deeper internal type of um, nutrient compounds. So bone broth you're going to get from either like um, a crock pot or you'll buy the bone broth or you'll do an Instapot with high quality good animal bones in there and or organ meats too whether it's liver or some glandular tissue, it's going to be excellent. A lot of good vitamin A, a lot of good fat soluble nutrients and bone broth's great because you can sip it and it really helps with the gut lining. It's very high in glycine, which is one of those uh, components that I think is affected by Roundup or glyphosate, right? Glyphosate, it affects glycine, right? What was the mechanism Stephanie said I've said? So yeah, it, I believe the, so the glyphosate, it is a, I believe it's a glycine molecule that has something extra added to it. So it replaces a glycine. It's like the body thinks that it's glycine, but it's not. So that's why it's so dangerous. But I imagine it may block some of the effects that glycine would normally have on the body, right? right? Glycine has a lot of beneficial effects at helping to be a backbone for glutathione. So I imagine that Roundup or glyphosate probably decreases glutathione function. And I imagine it probably decreases the and terocytes that line our gut. Cause I know there's research that in increases gut permeability. And I know glycine is really important 
for gut function, correct? Yeah, that would be the mechanism. She did talk about that, how it does, not only does it increase the leaky gut situation, but it also increases blood brain barrier permeability too. So if you have a leaky gut, you most likely have a leaky, a leaky brain as well, which is not good. And we're getting some questions in here that are inquiring about like, oh, if I get glyphosate toxicity, what do I do? I mean, I would say liposomal glutathione is great and or just a lot of the sulfur amino acids to make it. So like we have products that we use that give concentrated sulfur-based amino acids like glycine, glutamine, um, cysteine, taurine. So then these sulfur-based amino acids can get converted into a lot of these compounds and they run our phase two cytochrome P450 oxidase pathways. Yeah. So, uh, Samuel had asked about a product from Zach Bush called restore. I've had clients who've been taking restore for over a year. I tested their levels of glyphosate. These were people who said they've been eating organic. So we know they're getting no new exposure to glyphosate. They're not using it around the house and they've been taking restore for a year. Their levels will still, were still off the charts. So I'm not convinced. I know he's done some research on, on his own about gut permeability, which is awesome, but I've seen the data firsthand testing people and glyphosate levels are still high. Now, I don't know what their levels were like before they started that product. So maybe their levels were could have been way higher. higher. Exactly. And maybe it reduced it 10 times. So I'm not against it. I think it's in the category of things that might help can't hurt, but it's not the ultimate cure all. I talked with Dr. Shaw. He says sweating is key. And then Stephanie said that fulvic acid is one of the best binders to, to soak it up. And so I've been using a couple different tinctures lately to help with heavy metals and it happens to have fulvic acid in it. So that's kind of the go-to. That's excellent. So in general, a lot of the sulfur amino acid compounds I think are good to help with glutathione. Uh, I think getting liver tonifying supporting herbs, whether it's silymarin or milk thistle or dandelion root or even red root, things that support lymphatic flow are going to be helping. Uh, good sweating, good fulvic acid, minerals. I think all that's going to help. I want to say the last food and it's sweet potatoes and it's because everyone is against mm. carbohydrates so much and sweet potatoes changed my life. When I had adrenal problems, I was going so low carb and I couldn't handle the stress of it. I believe my, my adrenals may have just been too weak to adapt to ketogenic. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there was something else in my gut infections weakening me. But when I just added in a small sweet potato just a couple times a week, that was the carb read feed at dinner time that I needed to really help me yeah. sleep better. And then once I slept better, then I had more energy during the day. Yeah. And I think, you know, we got to look at your situation as you're definitely leaner and more insulin sensitive. So just remember if you're an insulin resistant individual, right? Uh, maybe a little bit overweight, hip to waist ratio is off a bit. That may not be the right advice for you. But yeah. if you're in a place where you're more insulin sensitive, you're at a, a better weight for yourself. It couldn't be, it couldn't hurt trying it and just seeing how things like your sleep improve. You've got vitamin A, you've got vitamin mm -hmm. B5, B6. Potassium. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Potassium, riboflavin. I mean, there's a lot of good B's in your in your sweet potatoes. I want to hit this question up and I didn't mean to distract if you had something else to say, but there was a question or just a comment from Gary. And he mentioned that the dilemma is you talk to the cardiologist, nutrition people, and they advise basically the opposite of what we're saying. However, if you listen to functional cardiologists like Justin and I's mutual friend, Jack Wolfson, Jack Wolfson. Yeah. He's a board certified cardiologist. Guess what his dietary protocol is for all of his patients. It's paleo. It's a paleo template and he reverses heart issues with a paleo template. So you can't pay attention to the conventional nutritionists that are trained by big pharma. And just remember when we, when we talk about any dietary advice, we don't talk about a diet. We talk about a template yeah. and that template allows us to take meat and bring it down super low because their digestion may be really messed up or sensitive, ratchet up all kinds of things like bone broth and healthy fats and, and plant proteins or plant nutrients, right? So we have in a template type of methodology, we have the ability to customize macronutrients, to customize the digestibility aspect of these foods to help someone out. So it keeps us in a position where we're the least dogmatic as possible because we have, we're not handcuffed to a diet, if you will. Right. Yeah. Well said. Uh, there was a comment here from Eva that you probably like to hear. Hi, Justin. Wanted to say my nightly leg cramps are gone since I started to take magnesium malate three times a day. That's cool. That's great. Really cool. Another Excellent. question here about char from Charlie grass fed beef, but grain finished beef still optimal. No, it's not. You want hundred percent grass fed grass finished. They do the grain at the end because it helps to add some fat and marbling to it. But I personally like 
grass fed and finished. Yeah, I mean, if you don't have the ability to get that because you you only can get the grass fed but grain finished, just at least make sure it's organic. So then there's going to be a less roundup or no roundup in the grains at least. So then you have at least that aspect. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. There's a Absolutely. question from another person. My son had gout. He eats grass fed meats, organic chicken. He's gluten dairy free. Any thoughts? Um, whose question is that one? It just says BC. There's no name, just initials. Okay. Got it. I'm trying to find that question. It was near the top. Okay. Got it. Um, so in general, I would just say first gout tends to be driven up by fructose. Okay. So fructose can get converted to uric acid. And again, it's fructose. We get a lot of questions about this. They're like, Dr. J, what's, what's fructose? It's fructose. No, it's not. It's fructose. I got a big conversation with Dr. Robert Lustig at the University of California, San Francisco about it. It's fructose. Um, but in general. I'm saying it like you then. I always say fructose. So I'm going to have to correct myself now. Yeah. Oh, he was like, dude, it's fructose. I'm like, all right, I'll say fructose from now on. Um, but in general with fructose, um, that can be the big driving factor of uric acid. All right, that can be the big one. So they may need to go, they may need to decrease some of the purine rich meat to start. So like a lot of the purine rich meat, maybe the organ meats, maybe the higher fatty meats. In the meantime, while they get the carbs down and they cut the fructose down beneath like 12 to 15 grams per day. And, and then, then grains too, because she said yeah. gluten dairy free, but she didn't say grain free. So grain free, if, all that. Get all that stuff out of there. I'd even do nightshade free as well. Make sure the carbs are very low and the fructose, the fructose is low as well, below 13 grams. And then start from there. And alcohol, I'd get rid of alcohol if they're doing it. There are people can, oh, I'm organic, gluten free. And then they drink two glasses of wine at night. Exactly. Yep. No. So I would start with that and then the alcohol as well and then see how it goes. All right, let's keep going here. Thanks for the feedback, Marianne. Uh, did you see any other questions? I think that was most of them. We we hit Samuel. He was asking about the supplements to eliminate glyphosate. I commented on that already. And then MM here, do you know of a good de desiccated glandular supplement? So desiccated glandular, so it's got to be... So it's got to be porcine. So for my thyroid support, thyroid balance, I have one. It's It's got some active thyroid constituents in there. So it's something I only recommend to someone that needs it and has lab testing to support it. So that's a good product, but wouldn't be necessarily recommended unless there's lab testing saying that you need it. Yeah, good point. Uh, last yeah. question here from Roshan. It's becoming evident my hypochlorhydria is due to loose pyloric sphincter that lets acid drain too soon. Exercises involving abdomen worsens it immediately anyway to treat this. Yeah, so number one, just getting the stomach acid and the enzymes up um, will help with that. Number one, it'll that will help with their work better, you're saying? Yeah, it'll make it work better. I mean, so they're saying that the pyloric sphincter, so that's the sphincter that goes from the stomach to the small intestine. Um, that is opening up soon. So I would just get the food digested better. You could always throw some bitters in to help as well, but I get that sphincter working better by getting the right pH there. And that tends to help. And obviously like the low hanging fruit, like not eating when stressed and such. Yeah. Not eating in a rush, not scrolling mm -hmm. on Instagram. Chewing your food up enough. Yeah. A lot of people have terrible eating habits. You know how many clients I tell that I want them to eat in peace and they laugh and say, but that's so boring. It's like, what are you doing then? And they're like watching TV, playing on their phone, reading the newspaper and like in an argument with their friend all at the same time while they're eating. It's like, no wonder we have a digestion problem epidemic. Yeah. I mean, I would just say if your digestion's better and good and you're feeling good after your meals, you can obviously cheat a little bit with some of those recommendations. But if your digestion's not good, then you really want to at least give yourself that 10 to 15 minutes a piece. It's easy. Five minutes mm -hmm. before the meal, chill out five minutes after, you know, try not to rush through the meal. Yeah. And then what can help a hiatal hernia is one, one there's some um, visceral manipulation techniques that maybe an osteopath or a chiropractor can do, but get rid of the inflammation in the gut, typically infections, H. pylori, SIBO, and or make sure the digestive support is on track so you actually have the right amount of nutrients, the right enzymes and acids to break your foods down so you can digest it and absorb it. I had a hiatal hernia at one time, and I think it just disappeared because I'm not bothered by that part of my... I yeah. my sternum, I don't feel anything anymore. Yeah, so. could have been infection-based. So let's kind of summarize a lot of the foods. And again, in no particular order, just because, um, you know, all these foods are going to be part of your diet and they, they should all be there. I would say bone broth. I would say ginger, turmeric. 
I would say a lot of your, your lower sugar fruits that have high bioflavonoids and phytonutrients with low levels of fructose. I would say your grass-fed meat. I would say your salmon and your good quality fish and such. I would say your good fats like avocado, coconut oil, good saturated fat, your chia seeds, your flax seeds, your walnuts, your avocados. Is there anything else, Evan, that you want? And then obviously your non-starchy green vegetables. That could be bok choy, kale, spinach, celery. Pumpkin seeds. Don't pumpkin forget. Pumpkin seeds, pumpkin seeds. Is there anything else you wanted to add to that list, Evan? I think good quality hydration. Don't skip mm -hmm. out on that. A lot of people do a lot of teas and a lot of coffee because they don't do soda, which is great. But you can't skip the good high quality water because tea and coffee, they are diuretics. So totally organic coffee all day. Great. But okay, you got to drink water as well. How simple. Bingo. I think that's excellent, Evan. Well, hey, today was a great podcast. Appreciate everyone listening. Head over to thyroidresetsummit.com. We got a summit coming out end of the year. It'll probably be in January. We're moving it back a little bit to get more great speakers involved in the summit, more time here. And Evan, anything else you want to say? I would just say, give us a thumbs up, give us a share, you know, hit the, the bell as well. So you get the alerts to these great talks so you guys can be involved and connected. Anything else, Evan, for you? Uh, people can reach out if they want to schedule a consult with you your site and they also you also have those supplements mentioned on there the curcumin supreme that's at justinhealth.com and then if you want to check out my site consult with me evanbrand.com we love helping you all we really appreciate the feedback take good care of yourselves evan you have a great day everyone out there have a phenomenal week too see you later bye now bye, -bye.